Welcome to Lecture 1, Analyzing Psychologist-turned-philosopher Jordan Peterson's Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief. In this first episode, we will be exploring the preface of Maps of Meaning entitled Descensus Ad Inferos, which is structured around introducing the reader to Jordan Peterson's journey from his rural upbringing in a Christian home struggling with metaphysical questions to his self-realization as a secular psychologist interested in the unconscious foundation of human belief systems that morally structure the order of civilization. Jordan Peterson, as should be well known at this point, is a psychologist at the University of Toronto. Although he has long been a well-respected professor with an impressive publication record and a popular lecture series based on his book, Maps of Meaning, He has only recently experienced a meteoric rise to fame due to his engagement with many psychological, social, and political issues that over-determine contemporary postmodern society. To be specific, Peterson has been a vocal critic of humanities departments which he views as chambers of ideological indoctrination into activist disciplines, as opposed to places of self-transformation through the logos and true speech. In this criticism of the humanities, He specifically problematizes the philosophies of deconstruction and the ontology of social power, claiming that they do not understand the underlying unconscious symbolic structure of their deconstruction or the complex nature of individuation. In contrast to a deconstructive philosophy and an ontology of social power, Peterson himself tends towards a psychoanalytic philosophy and an ontology of the power of logos or true speech. This philosophy is strongly informed by Friedrich Nietzsche, from whom he derives a considerable emphasis on the modern crisis of meaning and nihilism, and Carl Jung, from whom he derives a considerable emphasis on the unconscious structure of symbolic belief systems. For Peterson, by combining Nietzsche's emphasis on the individual's self-responsibility for generating meaning and Jung's emphasis on transcendental unconscious ground of individuation, He seeks to reinterpret Christianity and the fundamental nature of Western civilization in the 21st century. One may first ask why bother with a lecture series focused on maps of meaning. The first reason is that this may be a useful exercise for the future of philosophy. As mentioned, dominant philosophies in the past decades have emphasized deconstruction of rational order and critique of social power regimes which has in turn inspired a new generation of social activists who aim to undermine the contemporary structure of sexual gender relations, ethnic racial relations, and social economic relations. Thus, the main critiques of Peterson's work suggest that he is too conservative for interpreting the radical core of Nietzsche and Jung as justifying contemporary sexual, social, and economic orders. However, if the only academic engagement with Peterson comes in the form of deconstruction and critique, then we may well miss an opportunity to reinvent academic discourse, considering that his work, largely inspired from maps of meaning, has been broadly appealing to many demographics in the contemporary Western public. Indeed, Peterson's work has struck a nerve in the current cultural moment, and he has seemingly come to represent an intellectual figurehead of our time. This fact has led to extreme polarization, or at least has played into extreme polarization, which has called forth this figure to the world stage. The claim here is that this polarization is not primarily conscious and rational, but primarily unconscious and emotional. This means that this polarization may be driven by belief systems, of which we are not fully aware. Thus, in this sense, by offering a highly self-conscious and rational mediation on Peterson's work, by giving oneself to the power of the logos and true speech, without regressing into a primarily deconstructive or critical analysis, but instead a constructive reflective analysis, we may gain a new perspective on the appeal of Peterson to a broad audience, and also be able to integrate this work into the narrative of academic philosophy. This constructive and reflective philosophical methodology, it is argued here, is preferable when the alternative is to leave this job to popular media analysis which seems to only exacerbate polarization and lead to the formation of echo chambers. Finally, we here get to analyze Peterson as a philosopher. Maps of Meaning is Peterson's first major book, and his only major works that articulates his understanding of a range of subjects from metaphysics to psychoanalysis to historical ontology.
in that sense we get to see the emergence here of not just Peterson the academic psychologist, but Peterson the philosopher. Indeed, it could be the case that philosophy today can benefit from a deeper engagement with the ideas from psychology, and specifically psychoanalysis. This, I would claim, is in line with my general interest and effort of working towards a more psychologically or psychoanalytically informed philosophy. Here we see the outline of maps of meaning, the architecture of belief. The core of the book is almost 500 pages and is divided neatly between a preface, five main chapters, and a conclusion. In this lecture series, we will cover each section in full depth in order to get a better sense of Peterson's metaphysics and philosophy. This will hopefully help contemporary philosophers and social scientists to engage more productively in the cultural moment of our time and make informed opinions on the nature of Peterson's thought moving forward. As mentioned, we here start with the preface, Dissentius ad inferos. Before starting this lecture, I just want to quickly let you know three easy ways you can help this channel as it develops. The first is to like, comment, or subscribe so that we can extend the reach of these lectures to others interested in the frontier of philosophical inquiry. The second is to visit my website where you will find transcripts for each of these lectures in order to help you with studying. And the third is to visit the playlist of other lecture series. I'm currently now recording a less than nothing playlist focused on philosopher Slavoj Žižek's work. These lectures are of course aimed at a high level philosophical audience and I hope that they are useful towards grounding the next generation of philosophical thought. Finally, before moving to the lecture itself, I also want to emphasize that the best way to help this channel is to become a Patreon supporter. I'm committed to building this channel towards a foundational tool that can be used by the next generation of philosophers. I have received a lot of positive feedback so far, and I want to keep delivering high level and stimulating content into the future. I hope that you will join me in this creation process and encourage you all to get in direct contact with me if you have feedback or suggestions for growth. Towards that end, I want to give a special thanks to all the Patreons who have already donated. Now, let's start the lecture. The quote Peterson uses to start the book is derived from the Bible, which gives one a sense already that Peterson is strongly influenced by theology and metaphysics. Quote, I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. End quote. In terms of psychoanalysis, one could frame this statement formally and precisely as a relation between the symbolic and the real. In the psychoanalytic triad of the imaginary symbolic real, the symbolic and the real are located directly in relation to the other in an antagonistic relation. Thus the symbolic is often, or in its very nature, unconscious of its own foundation at the ground of world order. Its madness is preceded by a vanishing mediator. In contrast, the real is both the very primordial ground of the symbolic and, paradoxically, its retroactive effect. In this way, the best way for the transcendental to hide the secrets of being is in plain sight, in the very unconscious structure of our symbolic order. When Peterson infers that he will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world, he is inferring that he has developed an understanding of the very meta-level structure of the symbolic order, which holds the world itself in an intelligible structure. Of course, thinking in this way, that the symbolic and the real hold such an intimate relation, may be constitutive of well-informed religious subjectivity, but it is not very common in scientific practice. In scientific practice, the foundation of the world, the foundation of reality, has nothing to do with the symbolic, and thus may, upon first reflection, deter scientifically-minded modern people from a work that starts with such a bold, and theologically infused statement. However, we should get used to religious symbolism, since it is a constitutive feature of Peterson's thought in this book. Indeed, the preface itself possesses a title of direct religious meaning. The title Descensus ad inferos can be translated into either Descent into Hell or Harrowing Hell. This is an apt title for an intro structured around an archetypal situation for the postmodern subject which can be grounded in a young and naive rejection of institutional religion in favor of the secular scientific modern world, only to find that a truly moral self-becoming, in the real of chaos, requires a much more sophisticated metaphysics than offered by secular science. Indeed, throughout the narrative of the preface, Peterson finds himself battling with the meaning of existence and history, despite becoming a well-read intellectual with an understanding of modern science. 
This leads him into the depths of his own unconscious mind and the symbolic texture of history itself in order to attempt to read, in our present, the direction of Western civilization caught between two worlds, a negation of the pre-modern and a tentative affirmation of some otherness to come. The main lesson of this preface includes a meditation on the subjective temporal structure of crucifixion and resurrection, with the individual confronting his location on the metaphorical cross of finitude and mortality, and finally, the rose and the cross, the self-posited rise from the depths of hell into a full, meaningful, and true participation in the becoming of the infinite and immortal absolute. Thus, a secondary lesson from this preface includes a meditation on the paradoxes of suffering and pain, which should be read in opposition to theological traditions which seek to minimize the experience of suffering and pain in individuation. For Peterson, it is the very fall into the depths of suffering and pain which lead to the self-realization of a true subject. Here can we not make a connection between Peterson and the fundamental nature of the Freudian field, which seeks to identify a beyond of the pleasure principle. In this chapter, we see an opening set of quotes from Carl Jung, who is clearly located as the main intellectual influence of Peterson's transformation from crucifixion to resurrection. Quote, Something we cannot see protect us from something that we do not understand. The things we cannot see is culture in its intrapsychic and internal manifestation. The thing we do not understand is the chaos that gave rise to culture. If the structure of culture is disrupted unwittingly, chaos returns. We will do anything, anything to defend ourselves against that return. The very fact that a general problem has gripped and assimilated the whole of a person is a guarantee that the speaker has really experienced it, and perhaps gained something from his sufferings. He will then reflect the problem for us in his personal life and thereby show us a truth. End quote. Here we will analyze both of these quotes in turn as they are relevant to the fundamental foundations of Peterson's thought. Let us consider a representation of the first quote. This representation attempts to capture Peterson's metaphysical view of the world, which will be familiar to anyone who has listened to his lectures or speeches. On the one side, we have the existence of an invisible order, what in psychoanalysis we may refer to as the symbolic order, or simply, culture. This invisible order is invisible precisely because it is suprasensible, beyond sensation, the conceptual scaffolding of our mental geometry that provides for us a map for navigating the world. Consider the real of meeting any other human whatsoever. When one meets any other human whatsoever, one is not just encountering a flesh and blood body, but also a mind holding a symbolic order of conceptualization that is extraordinarily rich and complex. However, we never see this mind. We never see this symbolic order as it is from the inside as it is in its own reality. It is super sensible. It is invisible. Now, this order is not fully transparent to us for a few reasons. First, we do not know how the symbolic order emerges within an evolutionary context. We do not have a total evolutionary account or theory to describe how a realm of biological apes could develop a sophisticated socio-symbolic matrix of transcendental desire and meaning. Moreover, there is the further mystery of attempting to understand why our species, unique in nature, was able to develop this socio-symbolic matrix and what it means, if anything, for the rest of nature. Second, the level of richness and diversity of the symbolic order is of such a bewildering complexity that we can never hope to have a full understanding of its total structure. We by necessity have to reduce and simplify our maps in order to pragmatically engage in the world. And in this process, we can never be totally sure if we will reduce and simplify in a way that prevents us from paying attention to extremely relevant information, or even worse, as is a theme for Peterson, in a way that allows for the formation of ideological constructs that control the way we think and the way we engage with others. Second, this invisible order is something that protects us from something we do not understand. The something we do not understand is the vast unknown or the vast otherness that is the rest of nature and the rest of potentiality or possibility internal to our system and to our interaction with nature and each other. We have no idea what otherness exists outside of our invisible symbolic orders. Of course, the best mechanisms we have for understanding the otherness of nature is science. <laughs>
which has made considerable progress in previous centuries into understanding the structure of physics, chemistry, biology, and so forth. However, we do not necessarily have any good mechanism for understanding the unknown of our own potentiality or the consequences of our own interaction with nature. This is crucial for Peterson, because he views everything in terms of historically embedded action. Thus, in Peterson's view, we can never detach ontology from ethics of action. This relation between the invisible and the unknown is incredibly important to understand for this book, because his whole worldview revolves around the interaction of an invisible culture attempting to simultaneously defend itself against the monstrous unknown, and also an invisible culture attempting to explore and bravely venture into this unknown without self-destruction. The function and defense against the unknown and exploration in the unknown is the function of the subject, or in Peterson's metaphysics, the divine son. Now let us consider a representation that captures the second quote by Jung. In the second quote, we are asked to reflect on the idea that we can only trust whether a person has gripped and assimilated a genuine problem when that person has directly experienced this problem. Throughout the preface, Peterson attempts to convince the reader that he has been truly gripped in the totality of his being by the problems that confront our age and that this problem is a problem of meaning and nihilism in relation to the disaster of 20th century secular politics. The basic formula represented here is thus that of the objective problem of first the death of God, which opens up the secular space for political utopia. And as we all know, this secular space of political utopia was grabbed by both the extreme right of Nazi fascism and the extreme left of Soviet communism. We could also add that the space of political utopia was successfully conquered by Western capitalism, which also forms its own utopian notion of an inclusive, abundant capital without any marginalized external outside. Throughout the preface, Peterson introduces us to the way in which he has personally internalized this problem, and from this experience, how he seeks to play his role or play his part in rectifying the situation by helping us to understand the unconscious metaphysical structure of human civilization. In understanding this metaphysical structure of human civilization, we will perhaps have a deeper understanding of what went wrong in the 20th century so that we do not fall in the same mistakes in the future and can make a more balanced and reasonable navigation of the chaotic unknown with the invisible order of our supersensible maps of meaning. Indeed, we will learn that one of the precise lessons from this preface is not to too quickly close and complete a total understanding of the meaning of history, for this obfuscates the reality of the chaotic unknown, of which we can never have a complete knowledge. In the opening pages of the preface of Maps of Meaning, we are introduced to Peterson's upbringing in rural Canada, where he tells us about the crumbling religious architecture of his larger socio-symbolic matrix. Indeed, in this crumbling religious architecture, his own inquiring mind is complicit in its foundational deconstruction and critique. He notes, as will be well known to anyone who follows his lectures, that he found it interesting the way in which the metaphysical structure of Christianity functions on the level of action, structuring morals and beliefs that were essential for the family and for the larger community substance. However, what is clear is that what undermines this metaphysical structure is the empirical critique specifically in relation to modern science and the way in which modern science offers creation stories and explanations of reality that not only differ from the religious creation stories, but which directly contradict them. Indeed, in that sense, Peterson's narrative depicts a situation common to many postmodern subjects of the West. That is the experience of coming to see the holes and gaps in the structure of religion, and specifically the holes and gaps in the structure of Christianity. Of course, the main doctrines of modern science, that being the cosmic structure provided by general relativity, introducing us to the strange curvature of spatio-temporal reality, and the evolutionary structural logic provided by Darwinian natural selection, become too overwhelming for reason in itself to deny their truth and their validity. Thus, any irreversible process opens up for reason, an irreversible process where it can no longer bear the contradiction between religion and science where reason can no longer bear the fact that religious stories of creation and nature no longer make sense in light of empirical inquiry. I myself can relate to this process of becoming disinterested in religion due to deep engagement with the structural logic of scientific naturalism.
One of the main reasons why Peterson claims his reason could no longer hold religious metaphysics is related to the impossibilities of immortal resurrection and virgin birth. Of course, both claims of religion, that of the possibility that someone could rise from the dead into immortality, and that someone could be born without sexual intercourse, are something that make the modern mind, constituted by secular reason and physical naturalism, absolutely recoil. How can one hold a worldview based on these impossibilities of physics and nature? In order to believe in such things, one would have to sacrifice reason and naturalism, which have allowed us to construct the modern world and explain where we are in the cosmos. Thus, if one is to make this leap of faith, one has to do so without any evidence, and simply believe due to the historical weight of the movement of Christianity itself. Logically, Peterson found the situation untenable, but what follows was not a correlation with natural order, but instead a radical engagement with secular politics and the social becoming of history. Indeed, Peterson starts to account for how he jumped from his religious upbringing and into the modern world, which was riddled with its own seemingly much more central secular empirical problems. The world had been divided in the 20th century between the extreme left and the extreme right. The formation of an extreme right had led towards world war, and then the extreme left had led to a more prolonged cold war. Both ideologies were grounded in a totality that was purely secular and empirical, devoid of religion and God, devoid of impossibilities like virgin births and immortal resurrection, devoid of naturalist contradictions with science. However, both led to humanist devastation. The first was founded in the belief in a divine racial identity, and the second was founded in the belief in an economic egalitarianism. Peterson himself, it may shock some people to know, found himself leaning strongly towards the left, towards economic egalitarianism. Indeed, Peterson admits that he was quickly attracted to leftist politics on university campuses, and even joined the NDP, a leftist party in Canada, to help fight for social justice and economic equality. He states explicitly in the preface that he believed that socialist ideology was the key to political utopia, and that the core issues in society could be reconciled with economic equality. If everyone merely had their material foundations provided, then utopia would follow as a logical consequence. To quote Peterson himself on his retroactive perception of this stage of his individuation, I am amazed at how stereotypical my actions, reactions, really were. I could not rationally accept the premises of religion as I understood them. I turned, in consequence, to dreams of political utopia and personal power. The same ideological trap caught millions of others in recent centuries, end quote. In this sense, it is true that Peterson's own motion was a microcosm of the larger social forces of our age. In the same way, many before him had rejected religious metaphysics and then had fallen for the ideologies of secular politics. He also had fallen for the same game. Thus, we should personally reflect deeply when we seek to get involved in political games on the extreme ideological spectrum, and we should seek to investigate the structure of history, first and foremost, so that we do not fall for the same ideological traps that captured previous generations. From this experience, Peterson entered deep reflection and consideration of some oppositional ideas, which lead him to reconsider his stance on political utopia through socialism, quote, I read George Orwell's Road to Wigan Pier. This book finally undermined me, not only my socialist ideology, but my faith in ideological stances themselves. In the famous essay concluding the book, Orwell described the great flaw of socialism and the reason for its frequent failure to attract and maintain democratic power. Orwell said essentially that socialists did not really like the poor. They merely hated the rich. Sometimes I look at a socialist, the intellectual, tract-writing type of socialist, with his pullover, his fuzzy hair, and his Marxian quotation, and wonder what the devil his motive really is. It is often difficult to believe that it is a love of anybody, especially of the working class, from whom he is of all people the furthest removed. End quote. The fact that such an idea attracted Peterson should come as no surprise to the man who has now become a household name for denouncing the leftist belief in political utopia through socioeconomic reorganization of society along Marxist lines. Indeed, to this day, he maintains the same criticism of the left 
namely that it attracts people who make a life out of transforming themselves into victims, who spend their entire life complaining about the horrible social and economic injustices of the world, without reflecting on the way in which they themselves are a part of the system, or without really engaging in any productive action to make the world actually a better place. In contrast, Peterson notes that many of the conservative professionals he met in university seem to be the opposite of these self-victimization activists. Thus, a paradoxical structure emerges in Peterson's mind between the genuine caring people of the left and the genuinely hardworking people on the right. This balance of the two views leads him to become distrustful of any extreme ideology as detracting humans from the real problem of self-development related to caring and knowing. Indeed, after reading Wigan Peer, Peterson claims that he first became disoriented because he had lost faith in all ideological systems, whether they were religious or political. This led to first immense confusion on how to tell right from wrong, good and bad, and what to fight for and how to structure one's life. This was perhaps Peterson's first encounter with the true difficulties and problems of individuation. It was easy to say that you wanted to think for yourself and to be a moral person, but it was much harder to do so without a ready-made ideological blanket that will give you all of the answers and all of the problems, erasing the fundamental unknowability of the future and of human history and of personal action. As Peterson himself states, quote, I was cast adrift. I did not know what to do or what to think, end quote. In order to resolve this issue of thought and action, his first principle became to focus on changing the self instead of focus on changing others, this is, of course, a principle of action that he carries today and will be common to anyone who listens to his lectures. Indeed, it may be translated today into the comical meme of cleaning up one's own room before pretending that one has the answers to global, social, and economic policy. Peterson thus left the NDP and political activism. His mind slowly drifted from socialist politics to the psychology of ideology. He details the fact that upon his return to university, his focus had become much more centered and concentrated on the mind, and on the nature of morality, which he no longer saw as economically determined within either Marxist or behavioral theories of human action. Thus, he could no longer justify the hypothesis that social redistribution of wealth would bring us closer to political utopia. In this quest, his mind drifted to the real of human experience and action, which he saw as presenting us with irreducible metaphysical questions about the moral nature of good and evil. From these premises, the moral nature of the ideologically driven Cold War took center stage in his mind, and he spent most of his time wondering how the world could put the very existence of humanity into question through the development of atomic warfare. In order to answer these questions, he instead of turning to the mi macro picture of international relations, turn to the micro picture of the workings of the human mind and the most disturbing dimensions of our action. This leads us to an uncomfortable reality and another central premise of Peterson's philosophy, namely that the best defense against ideology is to realize that society is not divided between good and evil, but rather that every individual is divided between good and evil. For the Nazis, good and evil ran along racial lines. For the communist, good and evil ran along economic lines. But if good and evil runs along the line of the unconscious heart, then we are dealing first and foremost with the nature of human psychology itself. In this way, when one studies history, from the communist gulags to the Nazi holocaust, one is to understand that you are engaging in the highest possible self-analysis, because that could have been you in the gulags or in the camps. The mantra that all monsters are human, or perhaps that the monstrously inhuman is within, could capture this sentiment, both within Peterson's philosophy and within general psychoanalytic understanding. Now this brings us to a series of crucial events in Peterson's history, which he details with total openness and honesty, but which are difficult to read. In that sense, I warn you in advance that the following passages are difficult, but I think necessary to cover in order to understand the psychology of Peterson's own development. They have to do with his radical subjective internalization of the nature of evil and how it manifests in the human psyche. Quote, I returned to university and began to study psychology. I visited a maximum security prison on the outskirts of Edmonton. The psychologist told me that the harmless appearing little man who had escorted me out of the gym had murdered two policemen after he had forced them to dig their own graves. <laughs> 
One of the policemen had little children and had begged for his life on their behalf while he was digging. This really shocked me. I had read about this sort of event, of course, but it had never been made real for me. How could the man I had talked to have done such an awful thing? A paragraph later, he goes on to explain that when he returned to his courses, he started to play with this darkness he had heard about at the prisons. Quote, Some of the courses I was attending at this time were taught in large lecture theaters, where the students were seated in descending rows, row after row. In one of these courses, Introduction to Clinical Psychology, appropriately enough, I experienced a recurrent compulsion. I would take my seat behind some unwitting individual and listen to the professor speak. At some point during the lecture, I would unfailingly feel the urge to stab the point of my pen into the neck of the person in front of me. This impulse was not overwhelming, luckily, but it was powerful enough to disturb me. What sort of terrible person would have an impulse like that? I went back to the prison a month or so after my first visit. During my absence, two prisoners had attacked a third, a suspected informer. They held or tied him down and pulverized one of his legs with a lead pipe. I was taken aback once again, but this time I tried something different. I tried to imagine, really imagine, what I would have been like to do such a thing. I concentrated on this task for days and days. I experienced a frightening revelation. The truly appalling aspect of such an atrocity did not lie in its impossibility or remoteness, as I had naively assumed, but in its ease. I was not much different from the violent prisoners, not qualitatively different. I could do what they could do, although I hadn't. End quote. Thus we see here an elementary dimension of Peterson's self-becoming, which is his radical internalization of the nature of his own capacity for evil, he had not just read about evil, he had exposed his own heart to evil, and this goes on to shape the core of his philosophy. This is because he knew that he could have been one of the forced prison guards to dig his own grave, or he could have been the one who pulverized the prison guard's legs, or he could have been the one who ran the communist gulag or the Nazi camp. After these experiences, involving a radical self-exposure to the nature of evil, Peterson goes on to explain that something new started to happen to him. He started to distrust his own speech. Now he has already accounted for the, for, for the fact that he had lost all stability in the world due to a collapse of his ideological thought structures. This first happened with religion and God, and then secondarily happened with politics and socialism. However, it was now happening with the very elementary coordinates of his daily speech. The foundations of his worldview had been shaken so fundamentally that he identified the holes and the gaps internal to his very identity structure. There was no more ideology there to hold his speech. This is in psychoanalytic terms often expressed in the first stage as alienation in the other, and secondarily separation in the other. Alienation in the other is when you realize that the other is lacking, that it is inconsistent and incoherent. Separation is when you distance yourself from the other and start to develop your own identity independent from the other. This mode is then followed by an even deeper feeling of loss, since one is left without the elementary ability to even formulate one's speech. To quote Peterson on his encounter with his own conscience in these moments, quote, The voice employed a standard refrain, delivered in a somewhat bored and matter-of-fact tone. You don't believe that. That isn't true. End quote. From this experience, Peterson runs the test of seeing if he could discover whether he, or the voice, was more true. In other words, he was testing his own unconscious versus the ideological superstructures that had determined his existence. In this exercise, he comes to regard the intellectual dimension of his persona to be a total sham, a bric-a-brac of ideological nonsense. All of the arguments and ideas that he had read were not really him, but rather constructs of the symbolic order which spoke him. In history, one can think of individuals from a psychoanalytic perspective as puppets of the other, as being orchestrated by the invisible mechanisms of the symbolic order, as ideological masks. Thus, the amalgam of biblical metaphysical claims, communist economic doctrines, or scientific hypotheses about physics and evolution, were not really him, not really what he understood, and not really his true voice. Instead, they were just discourses of the other, 
that were being used to navigate social system power games. In other words, the unconscious voice that Peterson could no longer ignore started to win out over his ideological personality. He was being corroded from within by his own unconscious. Here, Peterson reveals that the work that helped him during this time was the work of Carl Jung, and specifically Jung's work on individuation vis-a-vis the false appearances of the persona, to quote Jung on the persona as a feigned individuality. When we analyze the persona, we strip off the mask and discover that what seemed to be individual is at bottom collective. In other words, that the persona was only a mask of the collective psyche. Fundamentally, the persona is nothing real. It is a compromise between individual and society as to what a man should appear to be. He takes a name, earns a title, exercises a function. He is this or that. In a certain sense, all this is real. Yet in relation to the essential individuality of the person concerned, it is only a secondary reality, a compromise formation, in making which others often have a greater share than he. The persona is a semblance, a two-dimensional reality, to give it a nickname. End quote. Thus we can see here Jung's fundamental claims of the psyche, that there is a relation between what Freud would have called the ego, superego, and the id. In the first part of the passage, Jung articulates the distinctions between the ego and the superego as the persona and the psyche of society, the utilitarian compromise between the individual and the collective. However, in the second part, Jung starts to articulate the notion that beneath the surface of the ego or the persona, there is the more substantial and more true reality of what Freud would have called the id. For Jung, this underground of the persona is the more true dimension of the subject, the depths of the subject, to give the jargon of modern depth psychology. Thus, we have a clear Jungian distinction here between the appearances of social reality and the truth of the inner psychical reality, or the collective unconscious. From these experiences, and now firmly entrenched in reading the works of Carl Jung, Peterson started to experience what he calls absolutely unbearable dreams. He claims that before this time in his life, his imagination was not very vivid, and his dreams were not very intense. However, once the ideological structures of his mind had broken down completely, his imagination opened up, and his mind was subjected to intense and destructive fantasies and terror that were more real than the secular physical reality. This led him to question fundamental ontology and the nature of the real. Quote, this idiosyncratic subjective world, which everyone normally treated as illusory, seemed to me that time to lie somehow behind the world everyone knew and regarded as real. But what did real mean? The closer I looked, the less comprehensible things became. Where was the real? What was at bottom of it all? I did not feel I could live without knowing. End quote. Here we have perhaps the last stage of Peterson's separation from the other. Not even the world here is conceived of as real. From the philosophical perspective, this is an essential stage in the becoming of the subject. Consider, for example, that the foundations of modern philosophy itself, starting with René Descartes, is founded on a gesture of universal doubt, on the nature of the real, and on the nature of the world. This movement ends up for Descartes culminating in the cogito of self-reflective thought, and eventually a grounding in the absolute reality of God. Now for Peterson, his own Cartesian moment is a paradoxical revival of the metaphysical substructures that he resisted and rebelled against in the beginning. Again, in Peterson's own Cartesian moment, he describes it as emerging in the height of self-disgust. While experiencing intense visions and a disconnection from the world, he had also been exposing himself to university party life and drinking culture, he articulates that after one of his drunken nights, he started to express himself in art, and what emerged from his mind was a twisted image of the crucified Christ. He notes that it was at this moment where he realized how deeply he did not know his own self. To quote James Joyce, James Joyce said, History is a nightmare from which I am trying to awake. For me, history literally was a nightmare. I wanted above all else at that moment to wake up and make my terrible dreams go away, end quote. This event is the final straw that leads Peterson to a commitment in psychoanalysis. He dives into Freud's The Interpretation of Dreams, 
in order to understand the nature of his unconscious and finds Freud's work helpful in terms of the seriousness of the scholarship. Freud takes the dream world extremely seriously and attempts to elucidate the nature of the dream world. However, Peterson concludes that Freud's work is insufficient on two fundamental grounds. The first is that he thinks that nightmares cannot be explained as wish fulfillments, or at least he cannot explain how the visions and dreams he had experienced were unconscious wish fulfillments. The second is that he had had trouble with the explanation that the unconscious is fundamentally sexual and believes instead that the dreams he is experiencing are religious in nature. From these two premises, the fact that he thinks nightmares require an explanation beyond wish fulfillment, and the fact that he believes dream visions are primarily religious or transcendental instead of sexual, leads him to further revisit the foundation of Jungian psychoanalysis over the Freudian school. In this analysis, I will simply say that the premises Peterson uses to justify a transition from the Freudian to the Jungian school can here be interpreted in a different way. The first being that in terms of nightmares as wish fulfillments, we should not assume that we are in any way as self-transparent to ourselves as we think. As Peterson demonstrates in, in this preface, there are autonomous voices in our head that have an intelligible discourse, and it could be that we do not understand our desires in the moments that we are experiencing them. It could even be that we experience our own desires as terrifying, as horrifying, the second being that the Freudian unconscious is, is sexual, but also intellectual. The unconscious speaks, and this speech is an intelligible speech that is involved in foundational metaphysical questions. In that sense, the relation between the sexual and the religious is intimately linked in Freud, and Freud was simply emphasizing that it was in fact the sexual that was primordial, and religion simply the secondary cultural excess. In either case, the debate between the meaning of the Freudian and the Jungian unconscious will not be resolved here, of course. Here to quote another passage from Jung that is cited by Peterson towards the end of the preface, quote, The psychological elucidation of dream and fantasy images, which cannot be passed over in silence or blindly ignored, leads logically into the depths of religious phenomenology. The history of religion in its widest sense, including therefore mythology, folklore, and primitive psychology, is a treasure house of archetypal forms from which the doctor can draw helpful parallels and enlightening comparisons for the purpose of calming and clarifying a consciousness that is all at sea. It is absolutely necessary to supply these fantastic images that rise up so strange and threatening before the mind's eye with some kind of context so as to make them more intelligible. Experience has shown that the best way to do this is by means of comparative mythological material. Thus we see here some of the foundations of Peterson's views inspired by Jungian psychoanalysis. The first dimension is that Jung approaches the side of the unconscious that clearly has a traumatic and horrific dimension, visions that the subject cannot simply ignore. The second dimension is that Jung approaches the side of the unconscious that appears as the ground of mythology and religion. We thus have the culmination of Peterson's journey with his dive into Jungian psychoanalytic mythology. Peterson claims that once he started to gain a deeper grasp of Jungian psychoanalysis, he began to study the mythological foundations of our culture based on principles of the collective unconscious, and that this activity cured him of his disturbing nightmares and visions. Thus it was from engaging with the foundational psychological structures of our history that opened the door to the writing of this book, Maps of Meaning. The two premises that he developed from the investigation into the psychological structures of our history involve first the idea that belief systems are world order in a literal sense, and second the idea that there exists universal moral absolutes that determine social success in history. The first idea that belief systems are the foundation of world order appears at first sight to be a simple and intuitive claim that emergent worlds of human civilization are first and foremost stabilized by the fact that people believe in them and that people work extremely hard to ensure that the belief systems they hold ground a consistent and coherent structure for explaining the world around them. Indeed, Peterson's own journey into the world and into the mind is a demonstration of that fact. The second claim is seemingly more extreme, 
but predicated on the idea that there is a universal dimension for human social action and that the individuals and societies who discover and develop in accordance with this universal dimension will thrive, while those who do not will fall and dissolve. Now finally, Peterson ends the preface with a summary of the central claims of Maps of Meaning. The central claims here represent the core of Peterson's philosophy, and again, for anyone who follows his lectures, these principles will be familiar. The first central claim involves the distinction between the two cultures divide, the divide between science and the humanities. In Peterson's ontology, the divide between science and the humanities can be expressed in the distinction that scientific representation fundamentally operates on an ontology of things, which can compromise an objective description of the physical world. In contrast, the humanities' representations fundamentally operate, or should fundamentally operate, on the ontology of action, acts which can lead to an objective valuation of the world. According to Peterson, it is through understanding the difference in these modes of representation, perhaps in their synthesis, that one can strive to reconcile the two cultures, on the differences between the sciences and the humanities, on the physicalist assumptions and the subjectivist valuation. However, here Peterson clearly privileges the ontology of the humanities, since he sees the nature of scientific representations, the ontology of things, as nested within an ontology of action, where subjective systems of valuation decide that understanding an objective physical world is a valuable activity in the first place. The second central claim of Maps of Meaning involves the idea that this forum for action and the objective valuation of things is structured by a triad of mother, father, son, which of course is a very Christian ontology of the world. In this structure, he describes the Great Mother as unexplored territory or chaos. He describes the Great Father as explored territory or order, and he describes the Divine Son as the subjective mediation between unexplored territory and explored territory. This is, of course, one of the crucial dimensions of the meaning of the title of the book, Maps of Meaning. One can also recall here the meta-level structure of Peterson's ontology as structure between the invisible symbolic order and the unknown noumenal chaos. It is from this ontology that Peterson emphasizes the importance of preserving a strong foundation for our cultural tradition, since our cultural traditions are valuable precisely because they are things that worked over the course of historical time. They are things that helped us to explore what was previously unexplored territory. Of course, however, since the unknown is always larger than the known, and the unexplored is always larger than the explored, the subjective mediation of the two is the most essential dimension, the dimension where a truly individuated and freely thinking subject develops the capability to become the hero of the journey. What cannot be ignored in this structure, however, is its irreducibly sexual nature, which here again allows us to make the connections with the Freudian unconscious as sexual in nature. Here, of course, we can perhaps see a metaphysics of sexuality in the very ontology of the subjective mediation between the mother and the father. In this metaphysics of sexuality, there is a movement of penetration and being penetrated, of activity and passivity. Thus, for Peterson, the woman becomes the great unknown chaos, and the man becomes the great structural order of history. This is perhaps one of the most important dimensions where Peterson is explicitly psychoanalytic over deconstructionist where deconstructionist philosophies would tend away from any metaphysics that reifies sexuality within a fundamental ontology of being. Finally, Peterson's third central claim is a basic formula for ideology and individuation. In Peterson's ontology, the formula for ideology is when the invisible symbolic order rejects the reality of the unknown chaos. The reason why this is a formula for ideology is that when the invisible symbolic order rejects the much larger reality of the unknown chaos, the invisible symbolic order starts to act with a pretense to absolute knowledge. The invisible symbolic order starts to act as if there is no great unknown, which requires an open subjective mediation. In contrast, the formula for individuation is when the invisible symbolic order enters into an acceptance or an embrace of the unknown chaos. The reason why this is a formula for individuation is because when the invisible symbolic order recognizes that it is internally inconsistent and incoherent, that it does not know everything that there is a much larger unknown chaotic reality around it. It is precisely in this space 
that the individual can be free to explore and grow and discover something new. This brings us to the conclusion of our introduction of Maps of Meaning. In this lecture, we opened with an exploration of Peterson's foundational philosophy, as expressed through a few core passages cited by Carl Jung on the structure of culture and truth. We then explored Peterson's early encounters with experiences of religion and atheism, as well as his early encounters with politics, and his early work as a socialist activist. We then analyzed Peterson's turn inward, away from ideology and towards psychological self-reflection, specifically on the nature of evil. We then analyzed the sections of the preface related to Peterson's own self-desolution, of his ideological persona and self-analysis of his dreams and visions that tormented him in early individuation. And finally, we analyzed the core introduction to the principles that structure maps of meaning with an ontology of action, a triadic metaphysical structure for historical becoming, and a formula for ideology and individuation. Thus, we come to an end of the introductory lecture of Maps of Meaning. In this lecture, I hope you have a good guide to the opening of the book and a good sense for what is to come next. In future lectures, we will dive into the core of Maps of Meaning and cover each chapter in as much depth as possible, developing helpful representations and emphasizing crucial passages as necessary for the deepest possible understanding. Finally, before moving, I want to emphasize that the best way to help this channel is to, again, become a Patreon supporter. I am committed to building this channel towards a foundational tool that can be used for the next generation of philosophers. I hope that you will join me in this creation process and encourage you to get into contact with me if you have feedback and suggestions for growth. Towards that end, I want to give a thank you to all of the Patreons who have already donated. Thank you very much. Finally, you can help this channel by subscribing, commenting, liking this video so that YouTube algorithms will increase the range of the video to others who may be interested in studying philosophy. And you can also watch or rewatch the playlist of other series I'm working on, including Slavoj Žižek's Less Than Nothing. Thanks again for watching.